Okay, so um, my name is, is Brian Kelly, and I, I work at Microsoft. Um, I had the opportunity to, to speak here yesterday uh, with Ron, Nate, and Elaine on um, open source firmware. And um, in, in having that, I get a little bit of a retry today in, uh, in this presentation. I realized that um, some of you may be unfamiliar with, with open compute the efforts that are, are going on there. So I'm gonna talk about Project Cerberus today, uh, which is focused on hardware security, which is appropriate for, for this audience. But I also wanna uh, maybe divulge a little bit and talk about open compute and give you some backdrop that's, that's kind of relevant to, to why and, and how Project Cerberus came about, okay? So Open Compute was founded in April 2011 by, uh, by Facebook, and they made some you know, good contributions and, and great forward momentum in, in establishing uh, Open Compute. Microsoft joined in 2014, and, and when we joined, uh, we made a, a contribution of a uh, open cloud server uh, system, which was a, a 12U chassis. You can see it there, it's the, it's the top image. And uh, that was optimized for density. And uh, when we made that contribution, the design of it was complete. It was, it was a product that we'd been using for some time and uh, contributed it to the, to the open compute. Then in October uh, 2016, uh, Microsoft announced Project Olympus uh, as part of open compute. And uh, that was a design which was not yet complete. It was about 75% complete. We tried to do a thing with this design whereby we wanted to foster community uh, feedback, similar to an open source project. You'll start it up, you won't yet be finished, you'll get contributions, and you'll come out with a great product. Um, project Olympus was, was a try at that, and uh, the community really helped to, to steer the design and uh, take us that extra 25%. So uh, the feedback was incorporated into the design. Um, all the manufacturing collateral for the product was, was open sourced. Um, and then later that was followed with open firmware to open EDK, open BMC, and uh, part of the PDU and plug strip uh, firmware was a open rack manager. And uh, that, that stuff is all out on, on, on GitHub and along with the board file schematics and manufacturing collateral. So the open source momentum, that first Project Olympus uh, design was an in Intel x86. What well, quickly followed behind that was a lot of other uh, manufacturers taking the same uh, form factor and design and giving more building blocks. And then there was more building blocks that followed that. Uh, including flash storage, hard drive storage, GPU, and PCIe expansion. So all of this hardware contribution and firmware contribution was great, but there was one thing that was missing, and it was what about security? And uh, if your Greek mythology is, is good, you could probably uh, tell from the three-headed puppies uh, what that led to, and that was uh, our establishment of Project Cerberus. And uh, not only on the announcement of Project Cerberus, but around the same time, we established a security forum in, in OCP. And um, the goal was to take, you know, typically proprietary uh, hardware security implementations and to, to open it up, open up the design and open up the architecture on, on how we do hardware security and to drive that forward with the, uh, with the community. So I have a quote here from probably somebody you probably uh, read about, which was uh, Alfred Char Charles Hobbs. In, uh, in 1851, he was, a, uh, he was a locksmith, an American inventor, and uh, he, he came under a great criticism for uh, publicly demonstrating how to pick some of the most secure locks at the time. And his response to all this criticism was that rogues are very keen in their profession and know already much more than we can teach them. 
And this was against the attitude at the time of security by obscurity, or, obscurity, or security through obscurity. Uh, he maintained that by being open, um, we can get more, uh, we can get uh, improved security uh, by being open about our security and, and taking feedback from others. So the, the Open Compute Security Project um, was announced in February 2008, so it's, it's relatively, relatively recent. Um, Microsoft and Google were selected as the, as the co-chairs, but we have many, many companies that, uh, that, that join weekly and, and can contribute uh, expertise and engineering time, um, making our lives a little bit easier. Um, it is community focused on advancing uh, platform security as a whole. So um, that's really the, the intro to, to OCP, just to let you know a little bit about it. Now I want to switch gears and kind of circle back to what I had originally intended on presenting, which was uh, Project Cerberus specifically. So um, uh, in the cloud or as a cloud provider, we have a different security threat model or different threat vectors to maybe you know, traditional uh, uh, enterprise or client. In the cloud, you're essentially um, leasing VMs to, to companies, but still maintaining ownership of the hardware. Um, those, those customers, they may, you know, their, their VM may be on different, different hardware at different stages or different times in its life cycle. Um, so it's really, how do we protect the, uh, the persistent security or the persistent security state of that device as it transitions through its life cycle, a physical device. We have many different threat factors. We've got customers who may be compromised with malicious you know, software running on their own uh, systems that tries to sp spread to the cloud. We have um, you know, people that may have malicious intent and pose as customers. That happens in both enterprises and, and customers or regular consumers. Um, we have in, insiders from within the company uh, who, you know, were no, every, every company is, is, is exposed to maybe the same thing, a rogue tech or, or somebody with bad intentions that tries to penetrate. How do we add security and depth and ensure that the, the damage they can, they can cause is minimized. We've also got supply chain threats, system integrator threats, and of course, manufacturing threats. Um, uh, Project Cerberus is, is focused primarily on, on firmware security and the attack surface of firmware security. Um, what is that attack surface? So, um, you know, driver, all driver, firmware interfaces, uh, access to flash during boot, uh, firmware interfaces are exposed, and the OS firmware interfaces are exposed. In a hypervised environment, if you're providing direct access to peripherals or the platform itself, there's exposure there. With firmware, in particular, unlike upper level software, you don't have a lot of uh, you know, detection and malware and, and anything running at that low hardware level. Uh, recovery, uh, if, there, if there are compromises there, can be challenging as it can disable recovery interfaces or choose to completely ignore them. And then, of course, if you get compromised, it can result in bricking, loss of the asset, and loss of data, and so on. Um, but there is some, some good guidance and hope through uh, a set of, of NIST standards that were, um, were published uh, about a year ago initially and um, then, then ratified a little bit more recently. And that was the NIST uh, 800-193. And it focuses on, on three pillars, the protection um, of firmware, uh, the detection of, of corruption or unauthorized access, and then of course the recovery. So uh, with, these, with these guiding principles, we align our, our security uh, of, of platform firmware and the platform as a whole. Um, and to, before we could do that, we had to take a look at where we were at 
and the current state of the industry. So the typical enterprise server in the industry uh, looks maybe a little bit like this. You get your motherboard CPUs, you may or may not have a baseboard management controller, and then you've got a bunch of peripheral cards that can plug in. Some of those peripheral cards may be more uh, powerful than the host CPUs themselves at certain uh, workloads. So security state, you've got the, the base firmware, you know, UEFI, there's some limited protection there, secure boot-like functionality, there's uh, uh, measured boot through the TPM, but the detection and the recovery uh, are, are very, uh, um, not really, not really all there. It doesn't have, it doesn't have complete coverage, and it's very platform independent on how these things are implemented. BMC, of course, typically not secure, uh, no protection, detection, recoverability, or attestation, and then the rest of the per peripherals that you'll find inside the enterprise platform, they follow the same suit. Um, so it brings us to uh, Project Cerberus. And what is Project Cerberus? Well, it's a set of requirements um, around platform uh, power sequencing and when and where and how to establish trust. Uh, it's also a set of requirements around firmware integrity, how to verify it, um, how to measure it. And then it's a chip that implements and enforces uh, all three uh, of those things. So uh, the Cerberus uh, root of trust uh, implements the, uh, the guidelines from that NIST uh, 800-193. Um, it's, it's a microcontroller that uh, enforces digital signatures on uh, firmware and components that don't necessarily intrinsically have any. Um, and we'll get to how it does that in a little bit. Um, it, prov it provides protection to uh, not only the platform firmware, but also the peripherals that get plugged into the platform. So your BIOS, your VMC, and all your PCIe add-in cards and whatnot. Um, of course, it's, it's CPU and vendor agnostic. So when we go back and we had a look across those vendors of the Project, Olymp uh, of the project, project Olympus, system architecture, there's multiple CPU providers um, and multiple hardware manufacturers that uh, have inconsistent or mismatched security. This puts everybody at a, at a common standard. Uh, so what is the Cerberus ASIC? Uh, it's a security microprocessor with internal uh, secure memory and uh, flash contains the accelerator, uh, typical accelerator blocks, uh, SHA, AES, it's got a random number generator, it's got a public key engine for public key acceleration, and a lot of functions and key derivation that you would typically do with, with public keys. Uh, some e-fuses for um, its, its own uh, hash or measurement of a public key that we use to load the firmware on it. On it. It's got a physically uh, uncountable function or a puff for some uh, additional entropy. Um, and it's got the device identifier composition engine that is uh, part of the TCG. Um, it also has, which allows it to, to be coupled with a, a CPU or component that doesn't have any security intrinsically in it. And that is uh, a special interface uh, that we designed uh, to work with SPY and QSPY and, and allow that, that uh, microcontroller be plugged on seamlessly without the host CPU even knowing it's there. And of course it's got all the physical anti-tamper as well to protect the, the secrets that um, it, it generates. So the interpose interface and how it actually works. So your typical processors have a boot ROM, they boot up, they read in um, some additional instructions from, from Flash. Uh, what happens uh, if what's on that Flash is really important, um, a lot of those processors will just read in whatever's there and, and go and execute. Um, so to ensure what's on the Flash is, is signed and um, 
is, is of good integrity and what we want to actually be there. Uh, we interpose uh, on that and in between it, this Cerberus microcontroller. So I talked earlier about the, the properties of, of, of uh, the project Cerberus and it was a bunch of specifications and what processors must meet um, in order to be considered secure or Cerberus compliant. Uh, if they're not, then they get this microcontroller uh, interposed between them and their firmware load store. Uh, what does this microcontroller do? Um, all firmware that's on that flash is authenticated before the CPUs are taken out of reset. Um, the Cerberus microcontroller stays in line. All firmware that's read in through the CPU is measured. Um, all spy transactions are filtered. So um, common uh, platform design is you will take a, a, a spy flash chip of, or an OR flash chip of a given size, 32 megs or 16 megs or eight megs. Firmware image might only be four, might only be two. So you've got with a typical uh, secure boot, it's only gonna measure the firmware that it's reading into load, but you've got a lot of uh, flash that's like a little black box or a blind spot to your, uh, to your system. So what Cerberus will do is it will ensure that that uh, unused flash is unreadable and um, that data portions or firmware regions uh, of the flash that is readable is unwritable unless the firmware that's been sent to it is, is authenticated. Um, so in enforcing those NIST uh, principles that we, we, we talked about, I'm gonna circle back to that standard quite a bit. Um, it, the protection where all flash accesses are filtered through the Cerberus ASIC, it stays in line when the platform is running. It ensures that any accesses out to firmware um, are, are right, are, are read, I guess, and are protected. Uh, it authenticates any firmware that's coming in. And there's a, a feature, um, which we'll, we'll, we'll get to a little bit later on of it, called a platform firmware manifest. So. In the cloud, uh, you know, software and firmware are continuously updated. As you manage this, this large fleet, um, you, you have to be dynamic in, 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 in rolling updates uh, seamlessly throughout the fleet. Um, so at any one point in time, there, there could be you know, the latest and greatest uh, firmware, but the following day, when you spin a new firmware or, or whenever your new firmware comes, comes along, your fleet is at a, you know, yesterday's version, uh, essentially, N minus one. So uh, the platform firmware manifest allows us to give known good, put known good firmware versions uh, or measurements of no good, known good firmware versions into the Cerberus microcontroller, and only those versions uh, can run on the platform. So what that gives us is the ability to maintain a, a good state. Um, and it's kind of like a soft anti-rollback uh, feature and roll forward uh, feature without the need to go and blow OTP fuses. Um, the detection mechanism, of course, uh, ser the service ASIC has secure boot. Um, it does its own secure boot attests to its own measurements. Um, it'll also go and measure the, the firmware that it's supposed to be protecting for the device it's supposed to be protecting and uh, include that into its measurements. Um, recovery, which was the other principle of the NIST 8193. Um, the recovery is policy-based uh, in, in Cerberus where we'll have um, bare metal recovery, if the system is off, we can do recovering. Irrespective of the power state of the platform, we're able to recover uh, firmware images at any point in time to a known good image. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, flash access is protected by Cerberus. And uh, we have automatic recovery flows should any corruption, whether it's a bit, bit flip or attempt at a malicious attack occur, we can of course uh, rectify that with um, some automatic workflow from within Cerberus. Um, now, there's, there's a lot, one of the reasons we went down the, the, the Cerberus path or into Cerberus is 
Um, a lot of folks are, are hardware suppliers are very focused on an individual product. If you're a CPU manufacturer, you, you know, you're worried about the CPU, the, the, the security of that CPU, and that's it. Uh, when you take a whole system together and you're worried about all of the components and how they, how they interoperate and the, the, the state of um, uh, the platform when it's booted and when it's running, uh, like when we take into consideration typical, you know, secure boot, you're going to read in some option ROMs, anything in the boot path, you're probably going to measure, but what about stuff that's not in the boot path? Accelerators, GPUs, microcontrollers that are out on all of these different components that are running in the system, some of them more powerful than a host CPU. Um, so with that, we, you know, the, the Cerberus uh, architecture was hierarchical in that we wanted to have this scalable architecture where we could have a, a single entity on a platform attached for all of those other components in that platform. We wanted to be able to access that before we power it, before we initialize the platform. Um, during initialization, an active rooted thrust should be available all the time. I should be able to ask it, hey, what's the state of firmware? Firmware gets updated at runtime. Uh, not only during boot. When firmware gets updated at runtime, measurements change. I want to know what's the state of the platform at any point in time. Um, so uh, that brought us to this master-slave hierarchy throughout the system. Um, components that, that didn't meet those standards, we'd have the ASIC uh, uh, interposed. Components that did intrinsically support those uh, just fitted into the fold because it would also conform to the attestation protocol. Um, the uh, platform uh, level attestation, as I mentioned, the single measurement uh, we extend, and using some acronyms here, platform firmware manifest, component firmware manifests, and uh, component device file uh, are all um, ac you know, acronyms that are in the, in the specification. But what these, what these stand for is essentially manifests of measurements of permitted firmware uh, per device. Um, there's measurement logs uh, that, that come out of the, 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 the Cerberus uh, platform ASIC. And then, of course, there's a certificate sealing for, for machines based on their ability to attest. So as Cerberus attests to the firmware, um, machines that are in good state get essentially a cookie on the, in the fabric. Um, so uh, a little more about the, 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 the Cerberus uh, security controller uh, enforces the uh, guidelines from, uh, from the NIST standard. Uh, it is a, a small microcontroller. It's also a bunch of, of uh, platform uh, specifications. It's a hierarchical root of thrust with uh, topology that provides attestation for all firmware. And uh, it's an open design. Um, uh, we open up the, the specifications and, and more of the collateral for Cerberus will follow. Uh, if you want to know more about it, if you want to participate in it, um, we encourage you to join the um, security project in OCP. Um, and with that, I'll take maybe some questions to keep us on time. Yep. One. Yep. Uh, yeah, sorry, a couple of things. So first one, uh, you talked about the recovery options um, and talked about uh, automatic um, recovery workflow on detection of corruption. Mm -hmm. Is there any um, path to provide um, reporting of that if it takes place. Yeah, absolutely. So um, but one of the things with it is it's, it's alive and running all the time. It doesn't boot and then go sleep or boot and load and go off and do something else. This TCB is active all of the time. So as we, we decide to go and measure it or, or ask it for measurements, uh, it'll provide you the most current measurement. In addition to that, when anything changes, it will raise an alert. Um, so there's, a, there's like a uh, interrupt that will come from the, from the ASIC and go into the platform to raise an alert to the attestation agent and then that will play back into the fabric. So any changes that are unexpected 
we, we get notification. And um, uh, the PFMs, I might, you know, I, I did have some backup slides to go into a Cerberus deconstruct, but I was, I was running a little over time. But what I will do is I'll jump down into a, uh, a key element of it, um, which is the platform firmware manifest. And essentially in our build system, when we build firmware, it, it spits out a, a manifest. And the manifest, of course, looks like, you know, if you, it spits it out in this human readable form, if you consider, you know, XML human readable. But it, it eventually gets built into a binary list that lists all firmware that's applicable for that platform. So you could have, you know, firmware version one, two, three, skip four, five, six, seven. Um, and they, they might be fine to run on any given component. Uh, those, those lists uh, are, are monotonic. So you, you, know, you flash it once, it can't take a previous list, so there's no replay on the list. Um, it, provide, it allows us to keep the fabric uh, at, at different states in, in firmware because it's always, it's always transitioning. You know, you got a tail end that, that might not get updated uh, as, as it might be on the, the, the last version of firmware as you're going through the fleet to update everything to the newest and change those out-of-station policies. So this, by, by taking the, essentially the, the part of the out-of-station policy and making this route of trust be responsible for the enforcement in that, it makes that higher level out of station a lot easier to manage. And the other thing is, you use the word tamper-proof. Can we yes. please never use the word tamper-proof? <laughs> I mean, 800-193, and I checked, yeah. talks about resistance to tampering. Yes. Um, and I, it may just be me, but I hate the word tamper-proof, because tamper-resistance tamper resistance, all good, but please never tamper-proof. Yeah, yeah, good point. So... Um, I just I just hot podged that together uh, yesterday after my talk and realized that I I might have been starting at a level um, in in Cerberus and going into the deconstruct without too many people being familiar with Open Compute and what exactly Cerberus was. But point well taken. Uh, um, is it possible to use um, a certified SQL element with uh, Cerberus? I'm sorry. I, I and is it possible to use an an EAL certified secure element? Oh, a, se a secure element inside an, yeah. in Cerberus or yeah. instead of Cerberus? I know. So, yes, the, the, the ASIC has a, a secure element, um, which is, gets back to uh, my friend's comment here about you know tamper proof compared to tamper yeah. resistance. But yeah, it's got a secure element inside for storage of its of the keys and the entropy that it generates. Okay, but it's not certified. It's, yes, it's 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 not it's not certified at this point in time. It's not certified. Yeah. So, and do you have well, what kind of uh, physical secure protection do you have? Yes. Uh, um, pardon. Um, do you have side channel? Yes, protection? side channel uh, protection. Shields and so on. Yes. So it has side channel protections. Um, the the thing about the certification. Um, in, and why it's not pursued yet on the device. The certification actually takes you know, quite a bit of time. We announced this in, uh, in um, October of, of last year. Uh, the certification tool, depending on where you are in the world, different things are acceptable. You know, in Europe, you've got the common criteria. Uh, over here, you have the FIPS. In China, you've got a whole different ball game. So, um, uh, the, the certification is something we're looking at through Open Compute, but uh, uh, it's it's still really TBD on what direction that will go. But great question. But, uh, I guess uh, looking at smart cards design may yes. be interesting. Yes. Another question. So when your chip is reading the firmware of the other chips to make sure they're valid, mm -hmm. is it just basically asking them, hey, can you tell me what's in me? Couldn't another compromised chip lie about that? Um, no, it's, it's, it's not. It's actually um, mastering the bus at that point in time. So it stays in line um, on what gets read. So the, the, all spy transactions, you know, they, don't, they don't complete, um, as you would think. Uh, the the ASIC interposes. If I go back, it might be easier to to explain through the through the drawing that I rendered earlier. Uh, oh, here, Whoa. where did we go? 
I went back a little too far. But the, the, host, the host processors cannot access that flash directly. They think they're accessing the flash directly, but they're actually accessing the ASIC. Um, and, and flash, as you know, is, uh, is, is like a memory interface. It's not like you know, transactional with a payload. So it has to happen in really tight time. The ASIC has to make a decision on whether it allows the host processor to access firmware from that device. And there's a couple of techniques that we use um, to, to achieve that. One, of course, is we have a special hardware interface that provides that bitstream kind of filtering. And the other one is a little bit of a honeypot design. Um, the ASIC, of course, or the, the, the SPI uh, interface on the, on the processors, in some cases, those will go into a crazy control loop and then assert and, and do all kinds of stuff if it doesn't get a read back from, from SPI within a certain time. Um, or if it doesn't read back the data it expects. So for that, the ASIC is able to essentially honeypot it. Let it, let it think it's doing one thing, but do another. I don't know if that answers your question or not. Or I guess it's sort of does. No, an attack I've heard in the past is you can't really re you can't really trust any device to tell you what's on itself yes. if you're not yes. using it that same way. But it sounds like in the case where there's flash separate from a processor, then you can do that. But are there cases like where a chip has its own internal storage that you try to verify? Yes, there are. And um, the internal the internal chip you 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 can't um, interpose the the server's ASIC. So that's a case of either working with the with the manufacturer to um, to ROM that internal storage um, and make it not not updatable and to read externally uh, to fuse that boot. Usually it's pin strapping to change that boot path off, or to adapt the security requirements that we put inside in Cerberus. But Every component uh, has to be uh, analyzed pretty much at, at face value. It's a lot easier when a component doesn't have uh, sec in intrinsic security to interpose the, an ASIC on the side of it or, or outside of it as opposed to going through a development cycle and um, uh, adding that functionality. So, in other words, it's easier to change a PCBA than it is to change a substrate. Your time is going to be a lot less. Time to market, that is, which is also key in the cloud. Right at the back, we got another question. Oh. So, you briefly mentioned about the use of puff for additional entropy. Yes. yes. So, what kind of puff is that? Is it delay based, RAM based, uh, or is it? It's S RAM based. Okay, yeah. is yeah. it also. Um, uh, resilient against known puff attacks. There are quite many of those puff attacks. Yes. Yep. Yes. So that memory that we have inside for the puff, um, we we actually have the that memory over as part of the the secure element. There's a, a, a mesh over it. We drive current through it. If we detect there's a uh, change in the state, the SRAM. If we detect that there's a tamper on there, we also have side channel attack. Uh, side channel. Uh, measurements in there too. Uh, so you're intersposing the flash accesses at the moment. Have you looked at any of the other buses, say LPC? Um, we, we have uh, considered that. The, 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 the thing is, it's, um, to, hit the, to hit the timing, it's not done in firmware or software at all. It's a, it's a new hardware peripheral, essentially. Every t to interpose in there and, and keep the same timing on the bus, you, you can't you can't achieve it with with software and DMA chaining your 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 set of times in DMA just gonna make you have to run that bus really really slowly. Um, so to keep up with performance and boot performance, um, it's an interface. But we are looking at other hardware interfaces and being able to interpose. Any more? Guess it's lunch, right? Ah, uh, we've actually got one more session. Oh, we got one more. All right. Which it's time for now. All right. Thanks a lot, folks.